It's interesting as I listen to Max and speaking of my ordination in 1965, I wouldn't have been able to recite the date of it myself. But I remember earlier in that same year, 1965, walking into a bookstore in downtown Amsterdam in the Netherlands and being somewhat surprised by the particular assortment of books that were on display in this store because it seemed at least 90% of them concerned in one way or another the affairs of World War II. And I thought to myself, this war has been over for 20 years. Why this preoccupation with all of those things that took place so long before? And in the center, I saw a book that was featured and the title of the book was this, Hitler, Het Geisel von Europa. Hitler, the scourge of Europe. And I picked it up and began to look through it, ended up purchasing it, taking it home because rather than just a piece of propaganda or a diatribe against Hitler, the book contained official documents that had been seized by the occupying Allied forces at the end of the war, including portions of Hitler's personal diary in which on one occasion he scribbled in his own hand, today I have made a covenant with Satan. In this book were vivid photos of the camps of the Holocaust. And that book was a book that left me stunned by its chronicle of evil. And I'm convinced that if we would have gone back in history, somewhere close to 2,700 years, a similar book could have been published in the ancient Near East that read something like this, Ahab the scourge of Israel. Because when we think of Old Testament Israel and of the corruption of those who ascended to the throne, particularly in the Northern Kingdom, we think of the house of Omri and we think of that one king who became known as the quintessence of evil and corruption. So that even Herman Melville, in America's most profound theological novel, and I'm not kidding, that is the deepest theological novel that has ever been written, I believe, in the English language, because Melville sought to capture the transcendence of God being symbolized in the whiteness of the whale, the albino whale whom some sought to destroy by charting its every movement, and by the chief character Ahab who in his hatred for this albino monster said on one occasion, discussing his feelings towards the whale that had taken away his leg in a former encounter, he heaps me so deep was the hatred of Ahab.
that in his monomaniacal pursuit of Moby Dick, he symbolized the hatred of the human heart for God himself and man's desire to rid the universe of a holy God. I believe the most powerful chapter ever written in the English language in any work of fiction is Melville's chapter in that classic entitled, The Whiteness of the Whale. And I challenge you to go back and to read that again. But in the symbolism of the work, Melville could think of no name more diabolical to represent the malevolence of this distorted captain than the name Ahab. The Old Testament king of Israel, who in his corruption married Jezebel and invited the false prophets, the cult of Baal, to settle and build their sanctuaries under the aegis of the monarchy itself. In recent weeks at St. Andrews, we have looked at the life and the ministry of Elijah the Tishbite, who was the thorn in the side of Ahab, and for whom Ahab had an abiding, abiding loathing, not to mention the hatred towards Elijah expressed by Ahab's wife Jezebel. And I'd like to look briefly this evening at an episode that takes place as it's recorded in the first book of Kings, chapter 22. Chapter 22 of 1 Kings reads as follows, Now three years passed without war between Syria and Israel. And then it came to pass in the third year that Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, went down to visit the king of Israel. Now you realize <clears throat> that when we look at the map of Palestine, Israel is in the north and Judah is in the south. And so we think that when we go south, we're going down. We come down south from up north to come to Orlando. But the Jews who lived in Judea went down to Samaria or to the northern kingdom in terms of elevation, not in terms of geography. So the Bible is not an error here, but in any case, the king of Judah, Jehoshaphat, went to visit the king of Israel. That is Jehoshaphat. He's famous. You've heard the expression, what? Jumping Jehoshaphat. Well, jumping Jehoshaphat went to visit the king of Israel, who was Ahab. And listen to what happens. The king of Israel said to his servants, do you know that Ramoth and Gilead is ours? But we hesitate to take it out of the hand of the king of Syria. So he said to Jehoshaphat, will you go with me to fight at Ramoth Gilead? Jehoshaphat said to the king of Israel, that is to Ahab, I am as you are, my people as your people, my horses as your horses. You know, we'll go into this war together. And so Jehoshaphat made a simple request to Ahab. He said, please inquire for the word of the Lord today. And that itself is astonishing that anybody would ask Ahab to seek the word of the Lord. So the king of Israel gathered the prophets together of about 400 men, and he said to them, Shall I go up against Ramoth Gilead to fight? 
or shall I refrain? These 400 prophets said to the king, go on up, for the Lord will deliver it into the hand of the king. And Jehoshaphat said, is there not still a prophet of the Lord here that we may inquire of him? Did you hear that? Ahab asks the professionals, the institutional prophets, the nobbies, the school of prophets here. What do you think? Shall I go up and engage in this battle? Will God be with us? And these politically correct clergy told the king exactly what he wanted to hear. But notice how astute Jehoshaphat is. He said, just a minute, is there a prophet of the Lord around that we can inquire of? That is, is there somebody here that will tell us the truth from the mouth of God? That's what Jehovah, Jehoshaphat was listening, was asking. Listen to this. So the king of Israel, that's Ahab, said to Jehoshaphat, yeah, there's still one man, in this case, Micah, the son of Imla, by whom we may inquire of the Lord, but I hate him. Yeah, there's still one prophet of the Lord around here. We could go ask him, Jehoshaphat, his name is Micaiah, but I hate him. And then he tells us why he hates him. I hate him because he prophesies evil for me. That's not the kind of prophesying I want to hear. Do you hear what he's saying, ladies and gentlemen? I don't want to hear the Word of God because I don't like the Word of God. And Jehoshaphat said, let not the king say such things. So the king of Israel called an officer and said, Bring Micaiah the son of Imlah quickly. And so the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat the king of Judah, having put on their robes, sat each on his throne at a threshing floor at the entrance of the gate of Samaria, and all the prophets prophesied before them. And Zedekiah, and so on, says, Thus says the Lord, with these, you, making horns of iron for himself, with these you will gore the Syrians until they are destroyed. And so all the prophets prophesied so, saying, Go ahead up to Ramoth Gilead and prosper, for the Lord will deliver it into the king's hand. Then the messenger who had gone to call Micaiah spoke to him, saying, Now listen here. The words of the prophets, that is, the professionals, with one accord, Encourage the king. Please let your word be like the word of one of them and speak encouragement. So the messenger comes up to the prophet of God and said, all the rest of the prophets are telling the kings what they want to hear. Can you please come down and give your agreement with them? We're all standing together on this. So Micaiah said this, as the Lord lives, that's an oath, whatever the Lord says to me, that will I speak. 
That's the history of Israel, beloved. The history of prophets who were sawn in half because the people are tearing down the altars of God and the people are heaping to themselves false prophets who will heal the wound of the daughter of Zion slightly, telling the people what they want to hear, so that prophet after prophet after prophet in the Old Testament who is obedient and faithful to God suffers the scorn and the hatred of the people. We remember Jeremiah who complained to God and came to God and said, Lord, everybody mocks me. I am in derision daily. Every time I tell the people something, there are 50 prophets down the street that will come along and tell them, peace, peace. I tell them that your judgment is at hand and they need to repent and come back to your word, but every time I say that, my voice is drowned out by these false prophets. I am going to turn in my prophet's card. I've had enough of this. I quit. Go find yourself another whipping boy. And he said, I will speak no more in your name. Then Jeremiah said, but your word was shut up in my bones like a fire, and I couldn't stop. And God came to Jeremiah and he said, Jeremiah, let the prophet who has a dream tell his dream. But let the man of God speak the word of God faithfully. And you see, that's the sentiment of Micaiah here. He said, as the Lord lives, whatever he says to me, that's what I'm going to speak. And so he came to the king, and the king said to him, Micaiah, shall we go to war against Ramoth Gilead, or shall we refrain? And this is astonishing. He answers him, and he says, go and prosper. For the Lord will deliver it into the hands of the king. He says exactly what the false prophets have been telling him. He just got done saying, I'm going to only speak the truth. I'm going to put, I'm going to say whatever God tells me to say. But in this case, sarcasm is dripping from the ink of the scriptures. So the king said to him, how many times shall I make you swear that you tell me nothing but the truth in the name of the Lord? And so Micaiah, as if to say, says this, you want the truth? You really want the truth? I'll give you the truth. I saw all of Israel scattered on the mountains as sheep that have no shepherd. And the Lord said, let these, they have no master. Let each one return to his house in peace. And what does Ahab say? Turns to Jehoshaphat, he said, didn't I tell you? I told you that this guy would only prophesy evil against me. And Micaiah said, therefore, hear the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne. Does that sound familiar? All the host of heaven standing by on his right hand and on his left. And the Lord said, who will persuade Ahab to go up that he may fall at Ramoth Gilead? So one spoke in this manner, another spoke in that manner. Then a spirit came forward and stood before the Lord and said, I'll persuade him. And the Lord said, in what way? And so he said, I'll go out and be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. And the Lord said, you shall persuade him and also prevail. Go out and do so. Therefore, look, the Lord has put a lying spirit in the mouth of all of these prophets of yours because the Lord has declared a disaster on these people. 
Do you see what God did? He was so disgusted with Ahab and with Israel that he gave them prophets after their own heart. He gave them priests after their own hearts. You don't want my truth. You don't want my word. You hate my word. Then I'll tell you what, I'll give you prophets that'll do nothing but lie to you. And I will send upon this people a strong delusion. Verse 28, Micaiah said, if you ever return in peace, the Lord has not spoken by me. And he said, take heed all the people. So the king of Israel, that is Ahab and Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, went up to Ramoth Gilead. And the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, I will disguise myself and go into battle, but you put on your robes. So Ahab disguises himself and goes into battle. Verse 33, it happened when the captains of the chariots saw that it was not the king of Israel, they turned back from pursuing him. But a certain man drew a bow at random and struck the king of Israel between the joints of his armor so that he said to the driver of his chariot, turn around and take me out of here, for I am wounded. Verse 37, so the king died and was brought to Samaria, and they buried the king in Samaria. And someone washed the chariot at a pool in Samaria, and the dogs licked up the blood while the harlots bathed according to the word of the Lord, which he has spoken. There's a war on the word. And when we speak of wars in our own experience, we speak of hostilities, and we speak of enemies that are engaged in battle one with another. Well, who are the enemies in the war on the Word? John has pointed out many of those enemies of the war in this war who are enemies of the Word of God. But why are there so many enemies of the Word? Let me tell you why. Because by our constituent nature as fallen human beings, we hate the Word of God. What does the Scripture say? We are at enmity with God. We're His enemies. And even when we are reborn by the Spirit and are reconciled by Christ and are adopted into the family of God, the flesh still wars against the Spirit. And even conversion, beloved, does not instantly and easily cure this deeply rooted hostility in our souls against the Word of God. It's not just Ahab, and it's not just the Jesus Seminar. We have met the enemy, and we're it. Romans 1, when Paul declares the revelation of God's wrath against the whole world, against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, that the whole point of that universal anger of God against the human race is fixed on this issue. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who do what, John? Uh, this is the game we play. You know how the, John doesn't preach. It's an antiphonal response. 
he checks your Bible knowledge, and the Bible says, well, let's, let's do that again. I'm going to give you a chance now. <laughs> For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against what, John? Against what? What? All what? All ungodliness. All ungodliness and what else? And unrighteousness of men. Thank you very much. I knew he knew that text. <laughs> Who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Now, various English translations render the word that is a form of the verb katakane that is rendered here suppress. I've seen it this way. Who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Who hinder the truth who repress the truth, who stifle the truth, and it is the word that is used for somebody being incarcerated against their will. The idea is that God's wrath is revealed against the whole human race because the primordial sin of us all is our propensity to hold down, to repress the truth of God. In this case, it's not the truth of Scripture, it's the truth that God reveals from the heavens. And Paul goes on to bring the whole human race before the tribunal of God, saying, because they knew God, they did not glorify Him as God, neither were they thankful, but became futile in their thoughts and their foolish hearts were darkened. Verse 26, oh, let's go early, verse 24, therefore God gave them up to uncleanness and the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves. Here's the primordial sin who exchanged the truth of God for the lie. This is what John chronicled for us in the first lecture. You see, this isn't just Ahab or Jezebel. It's the whole human race who systematically takes the manifest, clear revelation of God in nature, not to mention in His Word, and represses it, exchanging the truth of God for a lie refusing to honor God as God. This is our basic sinful disposition, and it has to do with how we handle the truth of God. Now here's the question, why do we do it? Verse 28. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind. By nature, our minds are depraved. By nature, we don't want God in our thinking. I give this much credit to Ahab. At least he said outwardly what we all by nature are like inwardly. I don't want to hear from that prophet. I hate what that prophet says. I hate him because I don't like what he says. The reason why the human race hates God is because they don't like what God has to say. Let's go on to the next act in the book of Kings, only let's go to 2 Kings, to the first chapter. Moab rebelled against Israel after the death of Ahab. Ahab is succeeded by Ahaziah, his son. And Ahaziah fell through the lattice of his upper room in Samaria and was injured. So he sent messengers and said to them, Go and inquire of Baal-zebub, 
the God of Ekron, whether I shall recover from this injury. Here's this new king. He falls. He gets hurt. He wants to know if his injury is fatal or if he's going to recover. And so he sends his servants, go and talk to Baalzebub, the god of Akron, the lord of the flies, whether I shall recover from this injury. But the angel of the Lord said to Elijah the Tishbite, Arise, go up to meet the messengers of the king of Samaria, and say to them, Is it because there is no god in Israel that you're going to inquire of Baalzebub, the god of Ekron? Now therefore, thus says the Lord, you shall not come down from the bed to which you have gone up, but you shall surely die. And throughout this chapter, time after time, the message of Elijah to the people is this. It's a question. Is there no God in Israel? Did you go run into Baal? the prophets of Baal? We see anything's better than the God of Israel. Five years ago or so, an article came out in World Magazine announcing somewhat cynically the soon to be publicized Stealth Bible. And this announcement of the Stealth Bible set off something of a controversy because the editors at World Magazine had gotten wind of a project related to the NIV translation of the New Testament, or of the Bible, in a, an English edition that was being proposed in which the translators in the preface to this edition made the observation that their endeavor, and I quote, was to correct the patriarchalism of the Bible. I cannot recall ever reading of translators who were putting together an English translation of the Bible saying right up front, our agenda is to correct the Bible. Jim Dobson was con contacted by World Magazine and asked to comment. And Dr. Dobson wrote a little sidebar for World Magazine in which he said that uh, he was not a theologian or a biblical scholar, but that he was deeply troubled by this announcement of the so-called gender-neutral uh, translation of the Bible that would correct this faulty patriarchalism of sacred writ. A few days after that issue came out, I received a phone call from Dr. Dobson, and he was deeply disturbed, and he said to me that in his entire ministry, he had never received such an avalanche of criticism for any stand that he had taken from within the church as he had on this. And he asked me if I would join a team of men who were summoned to Colorado Springs to meet with the president of the International Bible Society, the president of Zondervan Publishing House, some of the scholars who were working on this new gender-neutral translation, along with uh, Wayne Grudem, John Piper, Vern, Dr. Vern, Vern Poitras, and others who would uh, be involved in these discussions about this project. And so this meeting that Dr. Dobson convened at Focus on the Family Headquarters in Colorado Springs met, and the discussions were forthright, cordial, and bathed in prayer. And at the end of the discussions, 
the people who were assembled there set forth a list of criteria by which translations, further translations of the NIV would follow. There was agreement that there are times in sacred scripture when the word anthropos, for example, in, in the New Testament, the word Adam in Old Testament Hebrew can justly and legitimately be translated mankind or humankind, that they are in fact gender neutral, but that other words such as on air, andros in the New Testament have more specific reference to the male sex. And anyway, these guidelines were written down and there was unanimous agreement in the room and a solemn pledge by all those present to maintain these standards for any further translation endeavors. In simple terms, the representatives of Zondervan, the representatives of the International Bible Society solemnly promised to follow these guidelines and went out from that meeting and unbeknownst to the rest of the people began to get engaged in further production of the TNIV. I didn't even know that this was going on until the day before the announcement a few weeks ago on national television of the preparation of today's NIV translation of the Bible. The day before the national announcement, every member of the committee from Colorado Springs received a letter through registered mail from the International Bible Society people and Zonervon declaring that they were removing their names from the agreement that they had made the years before because they were going to go ahead with this project. I know that after they signed the document in Colorado Springs, they were subjected to unbelievable criticism and pressure from those who had a feminist agenda, and they are saying to the world that this is not their desire. They're simply doing this in the interest of accuracy, which in my judgment is simply not true. And I, I'm telling you this is going to cause a firestorm because right now the translation of choice in the evangelical world is the NIV. And I hope that will change. I thank God that the ESV has just come out recently where very serious scholarship was done and a very careful preparation for the new English Standard Version, which I hope in the providence of God in light of this new shift of uh, Zondervan and the NIV, I hope the ESV and the new King James and others will take away the domination of the NIV in our day, because even the translation now is a war on the Word of God. And I'm not talking about what I consider insignificant matters of, of, uh, of sexual discrimination. These changes that I've seen already in this go to the whole question even of the Son of Man. Uh, Christology of the New Testament, where when we look at the titles for Jesus on the pages of the New Testament, the number one title that we see in Christ for Jesus is the title Christ. That's a, a title, not a name. That's number one. Number two, in terms of numerical frequency, is the title Lord. Number three in terms of numerical frequency is the title Son of Man. But here's the significant thing about that, friends. 
even though the title Son of Man ranks third in terms of its numerical frequency in the New Testament, it is far and away the number one title that Jesus uses for Himself. It occurs like 82 times in the New Testament, 79 of which are coming from the lips of Christ. So that when Jesus communicates His mission and His person through His chosen title, the one that He uses for Himself is the title Son of Man which I believe is borrowed chiefly from the book of Daniel, but even has its roots in the Psalms. What is man that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man that thou dost visit him? Which has Christological implications. That text is changed in the TNIV. And I, I say to my friends, friendly fire, I would hate to be in your boots on the day of judgment when you play with the Word of God. So, my beloved, I warn you, be careful, because even Bible translation and Bible publishing is in a, in a situation where the temptations are enormous to be politically correct, to change the actual structure of biblical language to accommodate a philosophical, cultural movement of postmodern thinking. Because there are lots of people who don't like what the Bible says. And that's my nature. It's every day, it is a struggle for the Christian to submit to the whole counsel of God. I say to my students, if you want a, 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 a quick course in sanctification, go through the Bible, and every time you find something in the Bible that you don't like, put a mark beside it. And then just spend the next 10 years of your life really digging into those passages that you don't like. Because if you find a passage that you don't like in Scripture, then there are only a few possibilities here. One may be that you just don't understand it, and that's why you don't like it. And, and the giving it the philosophy and the benefit of the second glance, maybe by studying it more deeply, you'll get a, a correct understanding of the text, and your aversion to the text will be removed. So you gain. But even better is when you do your homework and you discover that your understanding of it is correct. Because now you know where your sanctification is needed. Because if you don't like what's in the Word of God, then one of two problems exist. Either there's a problem with you or there's a problem with God. Either God has to change His thinking, or you have to change yours. Do you see why this is a, a, a crash course in sanctification? If I can find where in the Scriptures I find myself hostile to the Word, it's like a mirror that God holds up before my soul and said, this is where you are at war with me. And so, if we're going to end this war on the Word, we have to start with ourselves. Because in our hearts, in terms of our original nature, beats the, the heart of Ahab. Let's pray. Father, where else can we go when You alone have the words of eternal life? Father, we pray that Your Spirit would so convict us of the depths of our sin that we will begin to love Your Word like Jesus loved it, 
and to rush to embrace it rather than to suppress it. And oh God, help us to want to live by every word that proceeds from your mouth, and not just by those words we like to hear. For we ask it in Jesus' name, amen.